Growing up, I mostly played a lot of Nintendo games, with the GameCube and N64 being big parts of my childhood. Even with my old Let's Play channel I had, I mostly stuck with Nintendo content, usually playing the most popular and oversaturated games out there like Ocarina of Time, Mario Sunshine, and whatever else I own from Nintendo. It's quite surprising how little Nintendo content I've made for this channel or even things related to official Nintendo games. Not counting the compilations of games, I made 8 videos dedicated to Nintendo from Itomo to Animal Crossing and even the Insanely Hard Hop and Challenge Run, where I spent 2 hours at the start doing nothing but waiting for Pokemon to die. But technically speaking, the last N64 related thing I made was not even really a N64 game, but a Zelda clone on Steam. I don't count those since they're from an old channel of mine, but still. But for those that have been keeping up with the indie scene this month, it has been crazy for retro style platformers. Cavern of Dreams just released, which has the N64 inspiration all over it. But today's video isn't about that game. Today I decided to cover another N64 inspired game that I felt wasn't getting as much love due to it releasing next to Cavern of Dreams. A game where you play as a goat looking for his lost nachos in a weird and eerie world. Fitting for my usual look at games for this channel, so why not cover it? I think it's time to jump into the world of Corn Kids, and it's with a Z because it's cool. Now, I don't blame you if this game went under your radar next to the other games on the list, like Bomb Rush Cyberfunk or Endless Fucker. <laughs> this is a fucking game, dude. But I assure you, this game really feels like a love letter to any of those wacky forgotten N64 platformers, while also being quite eerie at times. I think the biggest thing I enjoyed is how many options you have to add filters to the game. You can play at the normal 1080p plus options of 240p with the scanline filter on. You end up getting multiple forms for just this one filter alone with different types of scan lines. Not all filters are great, like the one that just blurs everything or the neon one that seems to just oversaturate the screen. Multiple options though are always a good thing no matter what, so props to the game for even having these multiple different options for filters. So I'll be playing the first stage in the 240p filter for those who want to see it in action, and for the rest of the game I'll be playing with the 1080p filter, as I personally prefer that one over the 240, but I would have felt wrong not showing off both because I know someone would probably prefer the 241 over the 1081, so why not show some of that off, you know? Corn Kids was made by the studio Bogosoft. You play as a one-horned goat baby named Sevi, and our main man finds himself inside a dream again, and it's the usual Nacho dream. Apparently our protag has been having this dream a lot lately, and isn't sure why, but with Nacho's calling his name, we head off into the gas station to end up in Lexi's Monster Park. We run into Alexis, who will be a big part of the game, acting as the respawn point in the game or gives you tips and tricks on what you're supposed to be doing in the stage. We ask her where we're at and she tells us in the park she made with many, many OSHA violations for sure. Apparently she made this whole entire park to test our corn powers, with Sevi saying we don't have powers, we're just crippled mutants. Sevi decides that he's not dealing with this today and wants to leave, but now the door he came through is up on the highest part of the level. Luckily, Alexis put notes everywhere in the level to show us how to play. So yeah, this first level is our tutorial level, but somehow manages to make it feel like it's not. It reminds me heavily of Banjo and Kazooie's tutorial section and how they did a similar thing with allowing the player to traverse the level while learning the controls, and you get a reward for doing so. But I think this game does that idea even better, so what can Sevi do? Sevi can do a 3 hit combo, dash in the air or upward, which will be your main movement options for platforming. You even have the usual ground slam move that every platformer should have. Being able to run up walls for a short burst is also cool, plus wall jumps and all that normal platforming moves. However, Sevi is not able to double jump and that really took some time getting used to. He has a single jump and that's it. Your jump will never go any higher than what it is already, even with multiple jumps in a row, so get used to it. You do have a way to get your jump back, but it requires you to use the dash move. So this can be used to gain a little extra distance or pull a sonic and homing attack off of enemies giving you an extra jump each time you hit an enemy. One of the biggest issues though I can think of for the platforming itself is the fact that Sevi feels pretty heavy. It can make some platforming moments a little more annoying than needed, so I can easily see this having a little learning curve for some players. But once you get situated with those controls, you can pull off some really neat jumps that probably aren't intended. Besides the moments from Sevi, you will also come across these birds that are used as bombs to blow up walls or objects in the level. You do get another one near the end of the game, but I'll cover that when we get there. But these birds are quite satisfying to use, just hearing them charge up to then shoot off and kaboom! Now before we really dive into the world, I want to talk about the environments and graphics of the game. I think by far this game does an amazing job at capturing the N64 look of platformers from Rare. They even have the classic Rare transition so it's obvious what the inspiration was here. 
it's so well done and the fact the game while having inspirations taken from classic rare it still feels like its own thing. I'm still tired of playing so many games that try too hard to be what came before and leaving no real reason to play this over the thing they're inspired by. It was the issue with the Zelda clone that I had that I basically made a whole video talking about. After looking at this game, I really expected the same issue to happen, but it never did. I would usually forget I was playing a Steam game, honestly, and not something officially on the Nintendo 64, which is an impressive feat. The enemies with their goofy looks and sounds and the squashing and stretching just give off an amazing cartoon feel that I didn't expect such low poly models to be able to pull off. Just look how expressive these models can get, and for being low poly and the animations being done with the models themselves instead of a texture changing, I think it comes off as more impressive because of that. Your life bar is also a soda bottle and you recover it by smashing into vending machines. It's a really nice touch that I think just fits with the character design of Sevi. Which makes me want to talk about their actual designs. It's that early emo punk look while not making them just come off as edgy bastards. So many devs make these edgy designs while making their main pro tag just be an unlikable asshole. So this is refreshing. Throughout my time playing, I was expecting Sevi to just start saying fuck and other edgy phrases. And while he does have some sarcasm and attitude, he never feels annoying or unbearable and he never drops the f-bomb. I think the dialogue really shines when you and Alexis have conversations in the game. Seeing how these two banter and give small jabs to one another while still feeling like they know each other just makes me feel more attached to these characters. These moments actually make me want to stop and talk to her when she does appear out of the portals because they just want to see what they have to say to each other. There's also this moment of them talking about the portals in the game and how she can only use them and when he asks why she's able to fly, she says it's just from the wind coming through the portal and that's why she's floating. It's just the little things the game does for details that I just adore so much, man. I think it's quite interesting how this game looks like those haunted N64 creepypastas with the ominous skies the weird architecture in the buildings, and somehow the game never goes that route. So props to the devs for the restraint. This could have easily just been some liminal space horror game, but the game again just features set pieces like these while never straying from the original vibe it has. The first stage is quite vertical, making the player rely heavily on wall jumping, slamming down arrays and lower platforms, and being able to unscrew screws or rotate cogs on the walls to push walls in, or you can pull them out of the wall to make more platforming paths. You even get a small swimming section, and if you play DK64, these swimming controls feel just like that to a T. Now the difficulty comes from learning how to use your limited moveset and creative ways to get around. Even when the game gives you a solution that should be obvious, if you think outside of the box you can easily find a different way of doing things and if a platformer can get you to think about ways to use the moveset to do things not the intended way, this is a sign of a good platformer. Now if the normal stage challenges don't feel that challenging, the game offers these mirror stages that are harder versions of the platforming you face so far. These can really test if you mastered your movement skills and the abilities you have for the stage. So when you do beat these, I feel like it's a good mark of mastering the stage you're in. Now you may have also noticed whenever I get these little cubes, a level icon appears on my screen. Well this is how you progress through the game to get to the other stages. You see, unlike most collectathons, how you're getting a single MacGuffin like a Shine or a Jiggy, this one requires you to find all the cubes to have a stronger level to open the level doors. 5 being the max and what you need for the true ending. So yes, if you want the true ending, you need to collect these and while some are easy to spot, others can be quite hard to locate. I didn't go for the true ending because I need to get these videos out and I gotta at least leave something here for you guys to discover when you play, but I do plan to try to complete the true ending on my own time. Now when you level up, you don't gain any stat boost, so it's just for progression, so don't expect to hit harder or whatever because you're level 5. Once we get through the giant labyrinth, we meet back up with Alexis who congratulates us on beating the level. She does say we can either go look for more XP or head to the next stage. I decide to head back out to the parking lot and we find this door with a weird face on it. Sevi, however doesn't have time for this and he just wants his nachos with Alexis promising a whole universe of infinite nachos. So I guess we have no way now to say no. We now have to explore to find a way to open the next path and after learning how to climb we climb up to this lamppost to hit a switch and this opens a sewer gutter. It's a nice touch when you walk in the water near the sewer gutter and brown shit just starts to fly everywhere, really reminding me of the conquer level that's just full of poop. And I can say right now I never expected this game to pull some vibes from conquer. The next stage is technically the first real stage as the first stage was again just a tutorial level and the third stage is just a full platforming gauntlet. I again never saw the level after that, so I have no comment for the true innings level. Wallow's Hollow is next, and this stage took me quite a while as it's quite massive and easy to get lost in. Especially as there's paths here that you won't be able to take till later in the stage. 
We learned that the pigs here had to cancel the lasagna eating festival thanks to the owl that now watches over everything. And if this isn't nightmare fuel, I don't know what is. We even get told that the owl turned the mayor of this place into salami and hung him on the tree for everyone to see. If you try to climb the tree, he will just knock you off. The owl mentions to stay away from the tall building showing us our place of interest. So I guess we'll head there. He even asked if you understand it and I said no and this caused him to repeat it and then when I said yes I understood he started to repeat it again with Sevi cutting him off. But now we're finally here and I want to mention that this level can come off as a drag at times since there's so many paths and a lot don't connect as well as they should. Mixed with how huge this world is and how dreadfully slow your movement can be when you are not climbing up stuff. I can't believe I hadn't heard of this before it came out. This game is incredible. Definitely the most complete feeling N64 throwback platform arrive ever played. The only thing that's noticeably modernized about it is that the smoothness of control feels more reminiscent of a GameCube platformer like Sunshine, which is also great. Also the vibes seem to have been specifically tailored for me. Edit. Okay so. The entire second level, which seems to be most of the game, is like. Boomer Facebook uncle level cringe doom posting about immigrants the entire time. It's literally almost every NPC hitting you with I'm a cuck and my wife spanks me because I try not to be racist to your dialogue. If you're good at ignoring it, the game's still great, the music and aesthetic is out of this world, plays great, it's just you have to spend the majority of the game with Fox News on in the background. A lot of the stage's runtime just comes from how much walking and backtracking there is. That's not to say I wasn't having fun exploring the stage, but I sure was over it near the end as I just kept feeling the game was dragging its feet for an ending I already knew was going to happen. Plus, mix this with some of the side quests here being so vague that I wasn't at all able to figure out how to beat them. One being helping the spider get back his cheese grater from his dead mom's grave. You unlock a new ability here and it's the ability to dig, but even after getting it, nothing happened. The dig ability lets you dig up dirt slopes and move on the side of the walls or go under small gaps. It's also the fastest way to move around. Other than that, it's only really useful on dirt. I even found this mirror stage that I couldn't reach because I couldn't figure out how to get to it. I know I need a bomb bird for sure for these walls, but there's not a bomb bird near enough that I could find to deal with the walls and where one is at that I know of, I couldn't bring it over, so I had no idea how to beat this. I'm very aware though this could just be bad game design with a mix of me being bad at games, but while other puzzles did get me stuck for a little bit, I still figured it out after a while, and it was quite satisfying to not use a guide to figure out the game. Mostly because there's no guides, but still. I just feel this stage copies the worst parts from Banjo-Tooie, having these very fast open levels and having no real fast way to get around. I felt these issues could have been fixed if they made the shortcuts easier to access, or honestly just gave this man a skateboard or a scooter, or just something that fits with the 2000s punk look that they're going for. If there's one thing that Tinykin does right that this game could really use, it's how it saves on the time spent backtracking and the long walks you have to do while adding a whole new dimension of platforming. Thanks to the soap bar, getting around the stages never felt so good because of how fast you are and also the fact that it works with the platforming. It makes the feeling come off more as not an object you just use to get around, but an actual part of your tools and your equipment. But even if you didn't want to incorporate the skateboard or scooter to work with the platforming here, just skating around itself would have been fun enough. This stage in particular also relies heavily on time trials. A lot of the puzzles end up being start here and get to this point in this amount of time. While I don't hate time trials, I can't say I like them enough to do them more than twice at one level, almost back to back. But with these negatives aside, they weren't enough to stop me from playing this level and just having fun with the world. From meeting this weird pig people and learning how they build a whole music box to try to stop the owl, to this pig that we make throw up a cube that we need. All these little moments here make this world feel like a lived in place, with characters talking about things that have happened here or going into more detail on the festivals. It really makes you attached to these characters in this place you're in. They even have this whole church and the priest is just saying crap, and when I got into the church I could see water droplets falling from the sky hitting the pigs below. I soon learned what I thought was water was actually the owl shitting on them. So, cool. Soon you will come across this music box and learn that the song now plays in reverse and they need it to play the other way to make the owl leave. Now most games would have just found some way to turn the cog the other way. Yeah, not Chord Kids. Probably one of the coolest effects I've seen since Majora's Mask, if you bring back the shopkeeper's five disco balls, he will use this machine that mirrors the whole entire stage for you. 
Yeah, the game decides the best solution to fixing the music box is to mirror the whole entire stage. And after you mirror the world, multiple things even change up in the stage thanks to the mirror effect. If you remember, the girl who threw up a cube said how if she was spinning counterclockwise, she would have thrown up harder. So if you remember this little tidbit and go back to her, you can finally get her to throw up a huge gym instead. You go to the music box now and play the music causing the owl to run and hide. The area inside the tree is one of my favorite looking areas for sure. The nice purple fog engulfing the area works so well with the brown and greenish color scheme. While I love this area a lot, I did run into a sorta of annoying issue that can affect the whole game, but more messed me up here. If at any point you were to fall from a high place, you have the option to work back to the circle nearest to you. If you do this before hitting the ground, you also take less fall damage, so it always comes off like you should be doing this since what's the drawback? Well, there's a part in this section where you have to do these platforming sections to hit these two owls to make a path. While doing this, I fell from a really high place and decided to reset myself back up, and then the owls also, for whatever reason, reset themselves as well. I don't know why sometimes the game will just reset your progress when you do this, but it happened a few times while other times the owls or whatever will stay where they were. Basically, it just seems like a not consistent issue, and I don't know how to make it consistent, or why it's happening. After a few struggles of trying to get up to the top, we finally make it, and the game warns you if you didn't have a level of 4, you can't progress. So I had to go and get more cubes, which I was able to find ones I was missing from the previous stage thanks to the new dig ability. And the game was also nice to make a shortcut back up to the top whenever you came back, till I somehow ruined it. And then I had to redo the whole owl platform part again. Once you make it up to the top, you climb a long vine path, dodging these bugs in your way, and soon you make it to the owl himself. He questions who sent us here, as Steve has no idea what he's talking about. But the owl tells us how the town belongs to him, and he won't let the pigs have it back. This fight is quite fun, and tests your platforming skills of dodging projectiles and fast ground slams while making the owl actually quite scary. His eyes are the stuff of nightmares. Climb up the pass and throw the bomb birds at him, blowing him up. Do this enough times and the owl finally dies. You free the mare as he turns back into his pig form and then he chokes to death and dies. How could this happen to me? I made my mistake. <laughs> we go to greet him just for him to basically get mad we blew up the owl. And then he also comes to realize that he was getting more donor support as a salami. So he basically tells us to leave while he won't even do the lasagna festival anymore, wasting our time here for nothing. While here, I had two random glitches happen, one being this rock just outright disappears. I'm sure this may have been because of the game's culling or whatever, unloading the rock once it was out of view from the camera, and the other required when a solar flare hit my PC or whatever, as it looks like the Mario 64 glitch that happened. Even looking at this frame by frame, I have no idea what even happened here, but these are just the type of glitches that I love. The door now opens and the game now welcomes us to the hardest platforming gauntlet in the game. This will require your timing and patience to make it through as platforms can move and falling here can really set you back. Even though this is a very hard and challenging gauntlet that I did like, I still have some major issues with it. For starters you learn real quick once Sieve is in a free fall state you can't do anything. Just fall through grabable pipes and basically just have to either fall all the way down or warp back and god forbid you didn't miss a portal on accident because if you did, back to the start you go. There's also this platforming section where there's a rocket blocking a button you need to press. I, for the life of me, have no idea what the intended method is here. But the way I did it was use these birds to get in the level and hit this very tiny part of the platform here. And this would sometimes create enough distance for me to barely make it on the wing. But I don't think this was at all what the game expects you to do. And if it is, this feels way too much like a leap of faith. I think the devs for not making you start back at the beginning if you do get a game over because they easily could have done that for crappy padding and I would have just given up. I do love the feel of the platforming, but at least the devs know the platforming isn't that good to justify screwing you badly if you die. Luckily, the bird you get in the stage is incredibly fun, giving you a higher jump from a slam or even slamming yourself into a wall to launch off of it, making some really unique design moments. Like this one where you have to throw the birds to hit all the cues with some requiring you to bounce them off the wall to hit it. With how this game really uses enemies like this, it reminds me so much of Klonoa. If you haven't played Klonoa, the way it works in that game, you use the enemies for the platforming and basically using them as like extra jumps or throwing them to hit objects. And man, I wish I saw more use of this in this game. The gauntlet finally comes to an end with a pretty fun boost pad climb where you dash into it letting you then launch up really high. But somehow, I had it fail on me twice, and if you fail it here, you gotta redo the small section over and over again. Since when Sev is in his freefall state, as I said before, he just passes through grabbable objects. It's just a little annoying as I wasn't even sure why I failed it, and I was getting punished pretty badly for failing it. I did manage to finally get it, and yeah, it's so cool if you pull it off. We finally make it to the top to meet Alexis, who tells us congratulations on making it up here, and explains how she doesn't have our nachos, 
but wants to explain something that's going on. The dream we're having is a trap made by the devil who wants to control our desires. He intends to use us in a dark sacrificial ritual involving latex horses and jello. Apparently as nights would go by, my corn powers would weaken and once they're gone she would never be able to see me again. And surprised she cares so much about us, she just says it's more because she doesn't have many friends. We're then forced by her to be launched out of this realm with us blasting off by her hitting us in the ass with her horn. Her final message to us is telling us that she'll find us in the next realm and then begins to eat our nachos and that was Corn Kid 64 At least this is the ending if you don't go for the true ending, but I'll leave that up to you guys to discover for yourself. Also while looking into this game's soundtrack, I found this channel called Mysterious Stranger 44 who uploaded the whole entire soundtrack, and I learned apparently that all the songs in the game are not even original songs, they're from chiptune artists back in the early 2000s. And some of these are so obscure that we actually have no idea what some of the artists like who made the song even are. Plus, he also told me that there is a bunch of weird secret dialogue just hidden in the game with TTS voices, and he did upload it, but I'm gonna go ahead and show it here, but if you want to go watch it um, on his channel, here's the video for that. Let's go. Oh. Hi, Nat. Um, I dunno, Nat. My dad told me I'm not supposed to use the internet without his permission, and he went out fishing at the Vortex Lake until dinner. Maybe I'll ask him tonight. So. Ah. Uh, well, okay. I guess if it will just be for a second, we can try it. Ah, don't get that juice on the floor. Cedric, Cedric, look at this. I was drinking my purple flavored moussey juice, like I do every Thursday morning. And I was looking at the back of it, where the moose is. And it says there's an internet moussey juice game you can get to go on your computer. You just have to use the internet to go to where it says, here. Come on, come on, let's go use your internet. Come on. Please. It shouldn't take long, and we can go and play it at my house, since I brought one of my data cards to copy to. Oh yeah. Personally, I think that these TTS voices were probably used to test the audio, or they actually probably had a plan to use TTS voices for the character voices um, before they decided to just do goat sounds. More often than not in game design and stuff, these are usually just here as placeovers uh, for, you know, future stuff. But who knows? This game is very weird, so I have no idea. But here are my final thoughts on Corn Kids. It's a nice love letter to the early Rare World titles that redefined what a 3D platformer could be, while having a weird spooky feel to everything in one package, and it sucks I feel this will get overshadowed by the other games being released as of late. Most because of how short this game is, but for the $7 price tag, I say this is worth it. Maybe in the future we'll get some DLC with some more levels or just free content added later on with more levels, because I would love to see what more can be brought to the table with this game. But with how it is now, it feels like a very impressive demo, and as soon as you beat it, you're going to be easily wanting more for sure. But yeah, play Corn Kids. Um, it's great, that's all I have to say. And by the way guys, make sure you stay tuned for the final video for October, part of 61 Days of Spook, as we dive into a cult classic game on the Dreamcast. But with that, I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.